Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Eddie Rice. Eddie is a professional speechwriter with over 10 years of experience in helping business leaders, keynote speakers, TED Talk presenters, and everyday people enhance the message they tell through great storytelling and structure. He loves creating strong narrative-driven speeches that focus on balancing emotional and thought leadership content. He is the author of a new book called Toast, Short Speeches, Big Impact. This book provides a step-by-step approach for brainstorming and designing the perfect speech. Now, public speaking is an important part of leadership, so I'm excited to have Eddie on the show to, so he can share some of his best practices. So, Eddie, welcome to the show. Thank you, John. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, it's good to meet you. Good to have you on the show. And uh, I'm really excited about this topic because it's such an important issue for leaders. You have to be able to know, you know how to speak in public. And there's so many opportunities where you get a chance to speak in front of people. And I'm really excited about the lessons we're going to learn through this process. But before we get started, tell us how, you know, what path did you take in life to end up becoming a speechwriter and a public speaking coach? Because that seems very unique. It is. And it was not a direct path, to be honest. I started, I would say, in college. I was a philosophy major, took classes in writing and rhetoric, and I was also part of the mock trial team. So it's kind of like debate, except you're arguing a court case instead. So you have to give, get up, give opening statements, closing arguments, argue objections. You got to really think on your feet. So that really trained me to, um, to do public speaking initially but I was actually a teacher for five years. I taught eighth grade science and I learned then how to take really complex topics and distill them down to where the students could understand them Uh, because many of our students didn't have a good science foundation coming into class and you had to make it a little bit simpler for eighth graders, but I enjoyed it tremendously. Um, But I left teaching after five years and thought I was going to be a public speaking coach. I was part of Toastmasters and The problem was, though, I had no business sense Uh, with my philosophy background and teaching background. No one really taught me how to be a business person, how to do marketing, how to get clients, how to get referrals. And my first foray into this arena actually failed completely. So what I did then is I pivoted. I said, well, maybe instead of trying to teach people how to be better public speakers, I can write the speeches for them and then they can go off and deliver them. So I discovered various websites that were the predecessors to Upwork, like Elance and Odesk and and sites like that. And there were people on there who needed speeches written. These were gig freelancer sites. And so I pitched myself and got my first set of clients. And it was then that I retaught myself how to actually build a website, how to do content marketing, how to do SEO, how to politely ask for referrals from people. And from there, it just grew and grew into what it is today, where I have a full-time job, but speech writing is on the side. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's great. So, um, yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, So if you, like, so it's a variety of services you provide. And so what are, what are like, like in your role, what kind of uh, services do you provide for someone that says, hey, I got to give a speech or I want to become a better speaker? What are the kind of services you provide? So it's twofold. One, if someone just wants to rehearse a speech with me, I will get on Zoom and we will just run the speech as many times as possible with a lot of feedback along the way. That's just how we get better at any skill. It's practice and feedback. And it's just having that continuous learning loop going forward. But if someone needs a full speech written, then we go through a brainstorming process where I ask people um, a variety of questions depending on the type of speech. Obviously, a wedding speech is going to be different than a keynote speech. And I have this set of questions that I ask people. They fill out a survey, and I get on the phone with them to talk through their answers. And from there, I create a first draft, send it over to them for their review, and we go back and forth on the edits so I can calibrate to their voice. And usually around three revisions after that first draft, we've got a full speech. Oh, okay. That's really interesting. Um... Yeah, I mean, I know, like, uh, for example, I had my first keynote that I was scheduled to do this um, this summer, but it ended up getting canceled because of this was up in Canada and because of COVID things. But uh, I was actually going to be looking for someone like you. Like, I've never done a keynote. I've done a lot of teaching, coaching, uh, public speaking, but not keynote. You know, that seems like I'm like, all right, people are paying to see me on stage, right? So, mm-hmm. so, so you're you're the type of person I'd seek out to say, all right, I've got something that's different than what I normally do. 
and I want to be able to step up my game. So you're the type of person I'd call. Exactly. Yeah. And there's a, there's a whole group of freelance speechwriters that actually exist for part of the professional speechwriters association. And it's this weird niche that actually works really well for a lot of people. And it's just a really great time. I get to learn new topics. I get to understand where these speakers are coming from. I get to hear their stories and I'm learning from them just as much as they're learning from me. And it's a really great way of doing business, I think. Excellent. Excellent. Well, you know, it's funny. A lot of people fear public speaking, right? It's a, it's a big issue. It's actually one of the biggest fears that, that most people have. Uh, and then other people are just bad at it, right? I mean, I, I've seen so many bad speeches. In, I did 22 years in corporate. I saw so many bad speeches. I can't even count. Even, if, even people who were doing keynotes for internal meetings, they were getting up there and talking in front of They were just terrible, terrible speeches. And um, so just as you, you know, your observations on things, what are some of the biggest mistakes leaders make when it comes to public speaking? I think first is a lack of preparation. I think people get really into the PowerPoint they're, they're creating. They spend a lot of time on the bullet points, which I don't obviously you know, recommend that you, know, you fill your slide up with bullet points, but it's almost all done at the last minute. And there just isn't that step to actually take a step back and prepare what's you, what you are going to say. Mm-hmm. And then second, I think it's this lack of practice where I'm a huge fan of the group Toastmasters worldwide group where people get together every week and they give prepared and impromptu speeches and they get feedback on their performance. So this happens often to a lot of leaders is they're not getting feedback on their performance. You have people underneath them who are one, I think, scared of giving that feedback or two, don't know how to give the appropriate feedback. And it's only when you seek out actual coaching, practice and feedback that you get better at the skill of public speaking. And it's a skill that can be learned just like any other. Yeah, that's interesting. So it's just, like you said, it's a skill that can be learned just like any other. And I talk about leadership skills the same way. Like they, they have to be practiced. You have to, you have to, you have to, you know, learn them, practice them, get better at them, get, seek feedback. It's the same. It sounds like the same scenario. You have to, you have to practice, you have to get better and you have to learn these skills and you have to seek feedback. That's very, so it's very common to just any other skill. Oh, exactly. Yeah, that's really wild. Uh, one of the things you say, and I really like this, you say that um, for speeches, we should find great stories worth retelling. And I really like that. So what are examples uh, in your mind of these great stories worth retelling? And how do those fit in a framework of a speech? I'm reading a really awesome book right now by Judy Carter called The Message of You. And she has this really amazing framework in it called Mess to Message. And the idea is, is that you look back throughout your life for times when there was a mess and what you did as a person to resolve that mess. And then you figure out what the message was of whatever it is that you did to successfully resolve whatever the mess was. And those are the stories that we can retell over and over again and just fine tune the message to where we need them. So I would suggest that for any leader out there to really look back on their life and say, well, when have you fixed something? When have you made something better? When have you changed yourself for the better? And what were those lessons that you learned? And those are the stories people want to hear because it makes you more humble. It's not you bragging. Instead, it's really about telling the message of how you resolve that mess. And that's an easy way to tell stories that I believe are worth retelling. So in other words, you take your your listeners on a journey with you. Uh, instead of you kind of projecting your message to them, you're saying, let me take you on a journey in, in this journey of, 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 of discovery in my life or something that happened in my life or some situation. And you take them along and then there's lessons along those stories. And then there's, and so you, you're more likely to pull them into, into the speech, right? Is that, is that the, the hope when you do that, when you're telling a story and, and, and kind of bringing them along? Oh, very much. And you can use the hero's journey as a um, metaphor as well, where you are the hero in your own story, the protagonist, and you have to overcome all of these obstacles along the way to get to the final end reward or the final battle. You have a mentor along the way, most likely. Uh, It's that same idea of overcoming obstacles and telling people what you learned from those obstacles and what you learned from all those battles. Interesting. That's really neat. 
That's really neat. So, um, so what you're saying is that when we when we find these stories that are worth retelling, they're they're impactful to to the audience, right? It's it, you're, it's meant to be impactful. Oh, very much so. We love to hear stories of transformation. We love to hear stories of people overcoming an obstacle or finding a new way of doing something or solving a problem. We're all looking for those same things in our own lives. And that's what really resonates with the audience. And it prevents you then from bragging about your accomplishments. Instead, they're cast as you overcoming obstacles. And that's a much easier, more palatable message for an audience to latch on to. Yeah, that's so true. It's absolutely true. I know in my in my you know time in leadership, I think the, the times I've told stories, the times that you can actually see the audience sort of like kind of leaning in and listening versus the time you're, you know, like sales are up 21% and, you know, costs are up 5%. So our profit is, you know, you see people, you know, falling asleep. But when you're exactly. telling a story, people are like, you know, what's, you know, and there's this tension that you build. And then, you know, they want to know how it re how it's resolved, you know, and it's, it's the same thing with writing, writing a book, you're telling this story that you create this tension, you bring people into the into the story, and then they, you know, and they're going to, they're more likely to be engaged and listen when they see that there's going to be an outcome, what's going to be the outcome, what's going to happen. And so you're, they're more apt to listen in versus spouting out numbers in a, in a, you know, boring meeting. So yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and you say this, and I like this, you say the the text of the speech is just as important as the delivery. Now that's kind of interesting because a lot of times in my business life, I've never written down the text of a speech, right? So I generally have an idea. I might have some bullet points that I want to cover, but for me, it's always been the tone of the message, but you're saying the text is actually as important. Yes. I think it really goes back to when I work with a lot of leaders who don't have a clear message. And I think it's understanding that you have to have a clear message first mm. and then delivering it. So in your case, if you've got your bullet points, that's great. And then you can just go up and deliver them. That's you know crystal clear on, on the message. So one of the things that I do with clients is I make sure that when we're writing a speech together, I have them write down what their main message is in one sentence. And then we use that as an editing tool for the rest of the speech, where we ask ourselves, okay, this content we're about to put in, does it relate to the main message? Does it support the main message? If it does, it goes in. If it doesn't, it's, it goes out. And it's pretty simple, but it helps you know stave off like really bad jokes or irrelevant stories. <laughs> and instead, it really focuses the entirety of the speech on that message and that theme that the person wanted to get across. And it just makes their overall then delivery easier because they have that clear message that they can get across to their audience. Yeah, I like that. So I think I think it's TED Talks that say, you know, what's your big idea worth sharing? What's the what's the big idea? And I'm sure that as you're working with someone who's given a speech, that's kind of the big question. What's the big idea that you're trying to share, right? And you want to keep everything around consistent with that theme. Yes, I think TED Talks are a wonderful example of that. Some of the best ones out there have that one clear message that they're going to get across in 12 to 18 minutes and they deliver and those speakers deliver it and they deliver on it. And that's what makes the great TED Talks so great is that one crystal message. So I would mm. suggest anyone out there looking to improve their public speaking skills. One other thing you can do is watch great speeches. So find the TED Talks that you like, find the commencement speeches that you like and start to really you know, uh, break down why they work, ask yourself what stories were told, what, what direction did the speaker go in? What were their main points? And if you can ask yourself those questions, you're going to become a student of the craft and you're going to help improve your own public speaking in that way too. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And those are great, great example. And, and even there, they'll show pictures. Uh, so you might be quite, you know, asking, well, how does PowerPoint fit into this thing? Right. Uh, but if you look and sometimes they'll share photos, but it's, 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 it's typically not a lot of words and it's, it's typically pictures and it's, and it's relates to the story, uh, versus, you know, putting up a hundred slides with, you know, 10, you know, 10 point font, uh, you know, tons of letters on, on there. But, but I think you can use, you can, can you use pictures, but it has to be impactful. Right. And that's what you see in Ted talks. Oh, very much. And I think all the slides that I've seen at TED Talks are really just great examples of amazing slide design. And I think I would love, I guess, for everyone to get to that point 
where they take the bullet points off their slides and instead just put up a picture that gets the point across instead. I even recommend to people that even if you are going to have PowerPoint, that you plan your presentation, you know, before you create the slides so that one, if the slides, you know, are corrupted or are missing, you still have your presentation, but then it also creates tighter slides when you have the words that you know that you're going to say, and then your slides are there just to support items. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's great. Well, you, I was looking through some of the stuff that you, uh, you've got on your, your website. One of the things I liked, you said, um, when it comes to leadership, uh, one of the areas where we do speeches, if you will, is promotions and awards. Uh, and I've done this a lot over my career. So, you know, you might gather a group of employees together and, and, and you know, Joe just got, got uh, promoted to manager. And so you, you congratulate him or what have you, or you might have a, uh, a service award or somebody, you know, won, you know, the quality award for the division, things like that. So I've done a lot of these, but you say that um, these are really important. And you say there's some things we need to remember when we're, use- we're giving these speeches. What are some things that we should need to think about when we're, you know, acknowledging employees? Uh, one, you want to honor the person and honor the event. Mm. If you can do that with any type of toast, award ceremony, speech, you're going to be in a really good spot. So the idea here is you want to tell about the great deeds that the person did to achieve that award. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, you want to talk about the meaning of the award itself among the organization and what impact that person had on the organization itself. So it's almost as if you are talking about the award and the person at the same time, uh, but you want to bring those two elements together And if you do that in your award speech, it's going to be more memorable, I believe, to the employee and to the employees that are listening. Yeah, I like that. I I had uh, when my young career, I was an engineer, and we we I won a global patent award. We we patented some idea, and and I was on a team that did it. But um, and the uh, the head of engineering globally uh, presented us with a watch, and it was this Rado watch. But then he talked about the watch and, and how it was a breakthrough in technology, just like the work that we had done. And so he tied the gift that he was giving to the to the act, you know, to the work that we had done, and made it a kind of a special evening for all of us. And uh, I just so when I was thinking about what he said, that was a great example of someone doing a speech right and honoring the event and honoring you know how how important this was. But he did it in a storytelling way where he had this watch, you know, that he gave each of us. That's kind of well, that's wonderful. That's a yeah. that sounds like an amazing speech. I love it. Yeah. So maybe he was doing the right thing a long time ago, right? <laughs> so yeah. some people are doing things good. That's good. Uh, but hey, let's talk about your new book. It's called Toast: Short Speeches, Big Impact. Why did you feel the need that you want to write some some of this some of these ideas down and get it out to people on a mass uh, mass level? First, I I always felt like I had a book inside of me as soon as I started to become a writer. And I think anyone who's a writer just has that book inside of them that they say, one day I'm going to write a book. Well, I decided to make my one day, you know, now. Uh, But what I did is I took all of the questions that my clients would come to me with in the speech writing process, especially for toasts, for weddings, for retirements, for awards. And I just wrote all of those questions down. And then I said, well, what advice would I give to them in these situations? And it turned into something longer than a blog post. And I said, I've got something here. And I think I can turn it into a book. And that's also why I included real examples of actual speeches to show the application of all the ideas um, from the first half of the book into the second so that people could get inspiration and then also see how to apply those ideas for their own speech. And it just really came together. It took about three years to write. Um, I had to take a pause during COVID because not many people were giving too many speeches during that time. But as you know, the pandemic has started to lift to an extent, um, fingers crossed. Um, you know, we've got this opportunity to get back out there to gather in you know larger groups and to go to those weddings, to go to those retirement parties, and to really talk with one another and show each other how much we care and appreciate. So it was just right timing, right place that allowed me to write it. Yeah, I think it's, and I love the cover. I love the design. I like the concept of the book because I think many of us get in a situation where they say, hey, where someone asks you, hey, will you, will you be the, my best man and give the best man speech, right? Hey, do you mind getting up and saying a few words uh, you know, at the ceremony? 
And a lot of times, you know, we say, oh yeah, I'll do that. But then we're like, oh, deer in the headlight, right? Now, where do I even start? How do I begin to, and then, you know, sometimes you'll see on, uh, on social media, you'll see these great, like best man speeches, you know, or the great right. father of the bride speeches, which are just wonderful. And you're like, I want it to be like that, but how do you, where do you even start? And what I like in this book is you say, here's how you start. This is what you need to do. And I love it how it's like a step-by-step -step process for like, because instead of just being a deer in a headlight and, and looking up, you know, what are some neat ideas for speeches, you have a, a, a like a step-by-step -step way of doing it in the book. And so tell us a little bit, you've got like this seven-day brainstorming system. Tell us a little bit about what that looks like. Sure. Um, it starts off with brainstorming. Um, as I, I, in the book, I put a lot of questions down onto paper to get people's ideas started because that's often the first kind of stumbling block that my clients run into. People come to me and say, I have no ideas. And I'm like, you actually do. You just don't know it yet. <laughs> yeah. we're, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions and we're going to figure out what those ideas are. And the idea there is to generate more ideas than you need so that you can edit them down later on. The second step is to come up with an outline once you have those ideas to say, okay, I think this idea fits in the middle. This might go at the beginning. This might go at the end um, and so on. Then it's coming up with the structure of the speech. And I lay out a few different structures for people to use um, that are repeatable, um, very much like you know Shakespeare had his five act play. I have my you know three story structure or one story structure for you to use. Then from there, it's about drafting the speech. You have to set aside time once you've generated these ideas and an outline and a structure to actually sit down and write. And one tip that I give to people that helps lessen some of that anxiety is, you know, if you're having trouble writing the speech, write it as if it were a letter um, that you were sending to somebody. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that and then just read the letter out loud, then you've got a speech. Um, and then, of course, the end of the process is editing and then practice and delivery. It's making sure that you have enough time that once you have your draft, that you edit it a little bit and that you also go back and practice it out loud or practice it in front of other people so that they can hear you and you can get some feedback before going up on stage and boost your self-confidence. And that's going to make you less anxious and nervous on the big day. Yeah, that's what I was just going to ask you. I mean, I think that, uh, again, there's a lot of anxiety when people are doing this for the first time or or not often, not frequent. So as you were just saying, so so I was going to ask you how you get over some of that stage fright or some of that fear or some of that anxiety. And you're saying, you kind of answered that question already, which is like, it's it's practice and it's feedback, right? Is that part of, part of how you do it? It's practice, it's feedback, and that um, will increase your self-confidence, which is one of the levels or one of the indicators of how well you're going to perform. And then I'm also doing some research right now on stage fright and anxiety. And what's coming up to the surface in a lot of this is also, um, what was I about to say? I apologize um, about yeah. stage fright and anxiety. I'm losing my my train of thought. <laughs> it's um, giving yourself the out to not have a perfect presentation. Yeah. It's saying that 90% is okay. Yeah. So if you were like an athlete and you were trying to get, let's say, a tennis ball over the net at a certain speed, if you can't do it at that speed, at least try to get the ball over the net. So when right. you're giving the speech, you're just up there to give the speech. It doesn't have to be the best presentation in the world. Give yourself some slack and some permission to fail a little bit, and you're going to have a much easier time in your brain and in your mind getting up there and giving the speech. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that. Just give yourself a little permission not to be perfect because that's what human nature, that's what humans are. We're not perfect. And in, in, in our normal, in a normal conversation, there are a lot of flaws, right? So a speech is, yes, it's a, it's a structured event, but if you make a mistake, people are used to, used to it in normal conversations, you know? So you just, you, you know, it's, I like, I like what you say is give yourself for, for you know, the permission to not be perfect. And, uh, and to just continue to, to move forward with it. So I like that. Yeah, that's really good. What, what about humor? You know, I know when I've seen some of these really good videos online of, of best of father of the bride or best man speeches, it's always just really filled with, with humor, but how do you help people find those humor stories? And, and, and I would say appropriate humor stories too, because I think, 
you know, especially in a wedding scenario, you know, you've got this mixed company, you know, and you don't want to get grandma to pass out, right? <laughs> with a story. So exactly. So how do you help with that? Well, one, I warn people away from just finding those really bad crude one-liners that are all over the internet. Like if you were yeah. to Google like best man jokes, maid of honor jokes, wedding jokes, you're going to find just some just not great jokes to give. And people have heard them before too. I mean, that's the other thing too. The other risk that you run when you get a canned joke is someone's already heard it before and they're just going to be rolling their eyes. Yeah. So what I tell people to do is to let your personality shine and to find the humor naturally in stories that you tell. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I've written speeches where it's been very easy to kind of uncover the humor in a story, whereas other times we just go the whole sentimental route and we don't even make it that funny. Instead, it's more sweet and emotional. And that's okay to balance your speech out. If you're not a naturally funny person, don't make this the beginning of your stand-up career. Um, instead, <laughs> yes. I would suggest that you look for the humor in the stories. And if it's there, it'll come out. But don't force it. And definitely don't try any of the one-liners that you find. They're just not going to work. It's going to sound unnatural and canned. And it you do much better just following the script, give, getting up there and giving a heartfelt speech, that's a much better place to come from than trying to be a comedian. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, be try to be yourself. Don't try to be uh, Joe Rogan, right? Right. <laughs> or whoever, whichever comedian. Um, so, you know, if, as people get this book and they read through it, what, what, are, some, what are some big things they're going to get out of it um, that, that are going to help them along the way? You mentioned the brainstorming and the writing system. You mentioned bringing in hu hum um, humor, uh, storytelling. You mentioned uh, the practice, you know, practice and feedback. So what are the other things that they're going to get uh, as they go through the book? I mean, you also mentioned some examples, right, of some good speeches. Exactly. So I really love the example section. I've got 10 example speeches ranging from wedding toast to retirement to awards. And those I just love. Um, I was just so gracious for the people that were able to share them with me. All of mine that I've written are under NDAs, unfortunately. Uh. Um, so I had to go out <laughs> and find different speeches to include. But I think overall what the book gives you, and this is what I've been told by a few people that have read it so far, is it gives you a peace of mind. There's a comforting feeling, knowing that you've got a system that you can work through and that's going to produce a speech in the end. It's the same system that I use with my clients. I didn't have to think very hard about the system itself. I said, I just wrote down what I do with people every single day. And it's going to be peace of mind that you get the most from having a system there and having example speeches to read through. It'll give you plenty of inspiration. And that I think is going to help you jumpstart your speech writing process to give a great toast. Uh, that's great. I mean, it's, it's super. I mean, it's a practical book to solve a problem that just about everyone's going to run into at one point in their lives that they have to write a speech or give a speech. And, and, uh, and, you know, we all need a little help. We're going to find that help. This is a perfect book to do that. So I think that's fantastic. And uh, I'm really excited. And this book just came out April 18th. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Yeah, so congratulations. It's been out there for two weeks. And uh, as I understand, the reviews are good. And, uh, and it's, uh, so it's available. So, you know, everyone who's listening in, uh, this book is available. And I just encourage you to take a look at it. If you've got to you give a speech, if you got to do a keynote, you're going to be doing, uh, like you said, a retirement or, uh, you know, the best man or the, you know, bridesmaid speech. This is a perfect book. And, and especially if you're the deer in the headlight, like, what, where do I start? This is the perfect book to do it. And so the book is called Toast, uh, Short Speeches and Big Impact. So uh, where can people find uh, the book and find out more about you? Sure. So you can go to ricespeechwriting.com. That's R-I-C-E, just like the food, speechwriting.com. And you can download the first chapter of the book. You can contact me. And if I'm you know, busy or unavailable for whatever reason, I have other people that I can refer you out to many of whom are better writers than I am. So you'll be in good hands no matter how we work together or what we're able to do. But I want to make sure that you get matched with the right writer, whether it's me or somebody else, to help you write your speech. Oh, that's fantastic. Eddie, I really appreciate you coming on the show. We're going to put links to those uh, resources in the show notes so everyone can find it. Uh, but Eddie, thank you for being on the show and sharing this wonderful book and all these great ideas uh, that we need to think about when we have to give a speech as a leader. So I appreciate you coming on the show and uh, sharing all your ideas and thoughts. Thank you. 
John, it was absolutely wonderful. Thank you for a great conversation. Thank you again. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.